The ACU football team turned Cardinal sins into a big homecoming win. I'm Kara Stutzman. And I'm Grant Boone. Tonight, the Wildcats hope to party like it's 1959 as they take on New Mexico State of the FBS. The KCS is next. <laughs> Welcome into Studio D1 here for week nine of the Ken Collins Show. I'm Grant Boone, joined by senior broadcast journalism major at ACU, Kara Stutzman, and second year head football coach Ken Collins. Coach, tonight your team tries to give ACU its first win against an FBS opponent since 1959 when the Wildcats beat Texas El Paso. We won't be very far from El Paso, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Right. This should be a fun night tonight. It should be. Our guys are excited. It's just a we get a chance to play on a different stage. Yeah. And we knew with this move up to the FCS level that we were going to uh, you know, be way more visible nationally. But this will, this will, this will help, and uh, it'll be interesting. It's a game on ESPN3 as well. Yes, it is. Well, this week, ESPN3. Last week, Shotwell Stadium, homecoming, wall-to-wall -wall people in the stands. You even had the 1973 national championship team there to watch you guys defeat Incarnate Word. How was that atmosphere to play for homecoming and for those guys in the 73 championship team? Well, those guys are, they, they set the stage back. Then. They had a great college experience, got a great uh, education here, and won a bunch of football games. Mm -hmm. And that, and that hopefully that is what we're, we're giving to our guys nowadays. Uh, we have done that, and just at this new level, it may take us a little bit to get there, but I think we're, I think we're going in the right direction. Homecoming here is always awesome. There are people crawling all over the place. The atmosphere is, is, uh, is really fun, and uh, we, we played well, and uh, so it made it worthwhile. 40 to 6 was the final ACU over Incarnate Word with the game highlights. Here's Ken Column Show contributor Matt Sloan. ACU was finally back at home in Shotwell Stadium for both homecoming and senior day, taking the field against Incarnate Word and looking for an undefeated home season yard line shotgun back to JD steps up in the pocket dumps it over the middle caught by Daryl Cantu Harkless for a touchdown it's six nothing ACU handoff up the middle dancing his way across the 45 yard line still in the clear and still on his feet to the 20 breaks a tackle and into the end zone goes Broderick Reeves for a touchdown incarnate word Following the Cardinal touchdown, Shark Hendrick West made several white jerseys miss on his way to the end zone, giving ACU a 13-7 lead. Then Angel Lopez picked off a Cardinal pass and killed their drive, but one interception wasn't quite enough for Lopez that afternoon. Play action, looking down the middle, throws it that way, intercepted Lopez again at the 30. Down the near sideline to the 40, to the 50, and inside Cardinal territory. David Baker drops back, throws across the middle, caught, touchdown, Jamie Walker. It's 19 to 6, ACU touchdown pass of the season, number 25 for the Wildcat. ACU would punt just before the half, but Keith Barnett would run down the field and recover his third fumble of the season, giving the Wildcats the ball and a short field. ACU's offense would convert again right before the half when Taylor Gabriel made a circus catch near the pylon. 30-6 ACU at recess. Here's one of three fumble recoveries for ACU. This one by Jesse Harper. The ACU defense dominated all game, forcing five turnovers. John David Baker would add an exclamation point to this win with a physical rushing touchdown. All cats on homecoming, 40-6. Thanks, Matt. When we come back, we'll take a closer look at that 40-6 win over Incarnate Word, and our play of the game features a very special cameo from the 1973 Wildcat team. Stay with us here on the Ken College. 
Back here on the Ken Collum Show, let's look a little more closely at that 40-6 to victory over Incarnate Word, homecoming, big crowd on hand. Coach, and you guys got started early. Uh, you get out to a lead, and on their very first snap from scrimmage, they fumble the football. Nick Richardson, I'm not sure if he forced it. He certainly fell on it. I fear that Nick Richardson is having such a solid season that we're overlooking how really well he's playing. I don't know that we talk about him enough. He's played a season and a half now at defensive end. He's already among ACU's all-time best in sacks. You tell me how well Nick Richardson's playing. Well, he's putting together a season where he, he's, he's constantly disruptive. And as an offensive coach, when you look at D linemen, the thing you don't want to see is guys that are disruptive. You don't care really how big they are, uh, how much speed they've got, how much strength, but are they disruptive? Do they? Can you see them messing up the other team's offense, basically? And that's what that's what he's doing. He's 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 put together a season and a half, probably, of just solid football. And uh, you know, people have to know where he is. Those offensive tackles have to set properly. They, they you you better have a plan for Nick Richardson, or he will. He's going to force turnovers, and sometimes, sometimes uh, it's like putting pressure on a punter. You know, you may not block the punt, mm. but he'll shank one, and and because he just knows you're there, he feels a little pressure. And a lot of times, that's what ha that that's what happens to offenses. Interesting. Yeah, I can even think about a couple of games, Illinois State and and Pitt State, where he didn't have huge numbers, but he was disruptive and and was a hair's breadth away uh, from right. uh, a, a few sacks. Okay, so. He, he got that initial takeaway. That was the first of five takeaways by your team. So you, you guys win the turnover battle five zip. You're now a crazy plus 18 for the season. While I, while I do think even an objective observer would say, Incarnate Word probably gave you a couple. It's one thing for the other team to put the ball on the ground. It's another thing for the opposing team to fall on it. And here's what I mean. You guys have 13 fumbles this year. You've only lost five of them, though. So you've recovered eight of your own fumbles. You've only lost five. So what's going on with that defense? How big of an emphasis is taking the ball away for Coach Darian Doolin? Well, it is for most defenses, but we really practice it. And the thing is, is we stress protecting the ball so much on offense around here. I mean, it's almost when you walk in, it is you don't even have to really talk about it. It's just a culture of, you know what? This is the way we do things around here, and you're not going to give the ball up. We've lost five fumbles, and that when you said that, I almost got nauseated. I mean, it's just like you don't lose fumbles. You just don't do that. And because we talk about it so much on offense, we talk about it on defense also. And it, and it makes them that much more aware and, and just keen about forcing turnovers because people don't protect the ball. You can watch at any level, uh, when you, when you, if you can freeze frame a screen, the ball is constantly away from people's body, whether it's the NFL or college or high school. It's just a hard thing to do. It's not natural to hold something tightly as you're trying to fight through and score touchdowns. And our guys defensively, they're running to the ball. And whether a team gives you a turnover, and sometimes they do, and they gave us a couple. But you know what? you got to be there to take them. And uh, the thing is, is if you're around the ball, if you've got 11 guys sprinting to the ball, swarming to the ball, if somebody does something crazy with the ball, like actually put it on the ground, you'll have a good chance to, to be there on it. So some of that is sloppy play by other teams, and, and, uh, but the fact is is we're swarming around the ball. We have just the amount of opportunities, same amount of opportunities to do crazy things and do stupid things with the sure. ball, like put them on the ground, but we don't do that, or we haven't yet. And the plus 18 turnover margin is awesome. That, that, is, that is in the elite level of mm. college football. There's only, only one team better. That's right. Only one team in the entire NCAA football at any level. And that tells you that there's buy-in on it, from your players. As a head coach, that's what you want. It's not how many sc points you score because those will come and go and, mm. and the sacks and all that. But are you protecting the ball and are you are you taking away the ball? And uh, that is ultimately what's, what uh, wins games for you. And I'm, I'm super proud of our guys for that. You said those five fumbles by your team made you nauseous. What if I told you only two of them are from your first team? Would that make you feel a little better? Slightly. I would just, yeah, I would just for, yeah. But I'd still, that, 
Uh, my palms are sweating now that you start talking about fumbles. <laughs> well, one of the one of the guys who was a big part of that five nothing turnover margin in favor of your team Saturday was Angel Lopez. In addition to ten tackles, a, a game high, a team high, I should say, he had two interceptions, doubling his career total. He had one in the first game last year. Got dinged up a little bit late in the game. So first of all, about Angel, not just Saturday, but his whole season as a safety for your team, and then how is he? Well, in our defense, the safeties run the show. They get everybody lined up. You, you have to know the game of football to be a safety. Good safeties are hard to find. They don't just, you can't just look out there and, hey, here's a good high school player. We'll make him into a safety. You got to have the body for it because it is physical. You got to cover and you got to come up and you got to tackle. But you have to know the game of football. You have to know when people put you in a bad spot. Good offenses will always put a, bad, uh, a defense in, in bad spots at times. And you have, to, you have to have enough awareness to get your, get your guys lined up. Angel does a great job of that. Super intelligent guy, super tough guy. Uh, and you, when, you, when you put a little pressure on the quarterback, he starts running around. Uh, one of those interceptions was quarterback's going to his left, tries to make a throw going back mm -hmm. to the middle of the field, sailed on him, and, and he made a great play. Uh, so Angel is, uh, you know, he's dinged up. He's going to suit up. We don't know if he's going to play. He, got, he, he twisted his ankle pretty good, but... It's not broken or anything, so we'll, we'll get him back on his feet. And regardless of what happens tonight, we've got a week off uh, this upcoming weekend, so he'll get to heal up for those last two games. You know somebody we haven't talked about much this year who, again, embodies that idea of swarming and flying to the football? It's your sophomore, Keith Barnett. He now has three fumble recoveries, including one on Saturday. Yep. He is always around the ball. Uh, and Not he's, everybody is like that, though, right? I mean, no, th you, aren't there some guys who seem to be around the ball more than others? Yes, and, and, and sometimes they, they're a little bit more gamblers, uh, oh, okay. and they leave, yeah. they leave their coverage a little bit early. But uh, Keith is a good player. He's, he's instinctive. He's getting better and better and better uh, every single game, and uh, I am, I'm proud of Keith. you got a couple of good sophomores from San Antonio on those corners. you got yep. Choppa and, and Keith Barnett. Right. Well. Talking a lot of defense this week. That's fun, isn't it? Good. By the way, your offense wasn't bad either. They took, of those five turnovers, four of them back into the end zone. Four touchdowns off the five turnovers. And one of your touchdowns was on the very first play of the second quarter, and it is our play of the game. Now, we're going to look at the first angle. Let's talk about the play itself. This is a play that's worked a lot for you with your tight ends through the years. It's John David Baker, 18-yard pass to Jamie Walker, Right down the middle, let's look at it. First play of the second quarter. Yep, we're faking a lead draw or an ISO. We're sending two backs to the same side, and we're clearing out with the tight end, and we hesitate a little bit with the, uh, the H-back there, and he's wide open. But look who's back there in the background. The 1973 the team. The boys. They were being honored in between the first yeah. and second quarter. <laughs> and so here are the national champions from 73. I think we need to go back and have Lance Fleming, our SID, add seven more points to their point total. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. They got a ground level view, and that was, uh, that was, that was very fitting they got, that they got to see that. They're, literally, they're in the end zone as the play's happening. The referee <laughs> dropped the ball on that one. I had a hunch that had there been an interception that would have been taken back the other way, there's no way Dub Stocker or Chip Martin, or those guys would have let that guy score. Oh, that guy would have been cream. He would have gotten oh, crushed well short yeah. of the goal line. No doubt. Now, those that might have been bad. the last thing those guys did for a while. Yeah, but they, they would have been, we would have been talking about it like right here, right now. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a surreal kind of play. We're celebrating a touchdown. We look over there, uh, and there they go. A um, couple things here to finish up. Daryl Cantu Harkless and Charkant Request both went over 100 yards receiving and rushing. I mean, senior day, you don't always get to draw it up like this, but it was neat to see the senior John David Baker throw for three touchdowns and run another win in and see DCH and Shark have a big day was fun, and Hog as well. Because yeah, these, these seniors have, I mean, they've been here and done it, mm. and they know, they, they are the epitome of ACU football, and there's total buy-in from those guys, great leadership, and uh, I'm glad all of them, or many of them got in the end zone, but all of them had a solid game. Really fun. 40 to 6, the final score as ACU knocks off Incarnate Word. When we come back in just a little bit, we'll have more on the Ken Column Show. But as we go to break, take a look at scores from the Southland Conference last week, including a big McNeese State win at home over national and conference power, Sam Houston State. Keep it here on the Ken Column Show.
Welcome back to the King Column Show. At every home game for the Wildcats, there's a group of guys painted up and ready to cheer on their team. Some people call them weird, others call them awesome. We like to call them super fans. <laughs> The skull was actually passed down to me, and so it kind of got me pumped up to be a part of it. And so then we started painting up with, my, with a group of my friends, and we just started really enjoying it. And so we've, ever since then, every single home game we've been here. Uh, no matter, I mean, last year we were here in 30 degree weather; it was dreadful, but we were here nonetheless. So uh, that's kind of what started, I guess, and it's just kind of grown from there. Other than we look like the Longhorns defense right then, that was a really good run. All right, let's kick it good. Number 43, Nick Growl. Oh, I'm kicking it well. Block that kick! Block that kick! Block that kick! Uh, super fan, I uh, really just means coming out and supporting our. Uh, Supporting the cats in every in every aspect, uh, regardless of whether we win or lose, uh, rain or shine, whether it's freezing or just absolutely burning hot, uh, you just hear no matter what for them, um, and you just you just cheer them on with all your heart. Oh, dude, I'm starting to itch. Do oh, stop, don't itch. <laughs> And there's only been two minutes that I've been carrying this thing. <laughs> it's just clock's been stopping like Oh that. my god. Oh. Did your nipple hurt? No, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, see you. Is that all I can come up with? Uh, school spirit is just um, always coming out and supporting the team, no matter if you think they're going to win or lose or if you think that it's going to be a blowout or if it's halftime and we're winning by like 70, it's just staying until the end just to support the team no matter like well, no matter what the score is or what how cold or hot or rain or snow whatever. Don't drop the baby powder. Shotwell wasn't the only stadium packed this weekend for homecoming. On Friday, the soccer team took on Oral Roberts and beat them 2-1. to one. Saturday night, volleyball played Incarnate Word, unfortunately losing in three sets, but they gave it a great effort. And then to round out the weekend of Cardinals, soccer played Incarnate Word and beat them 3-1 to one behind Andrea Carpenter, who scored two goals and is a Southland Conference Player of the Week. When we get back to the King Column Show, we'll preview the ACU game against New Mexico State, so stay with us. Back here on the King Column Show, take a look at the action today around the Southland Conference. Coach McNeese State, a huge win over Sam Houston State last week, but the Cowboys now have to go on the road to play Nichols State. The Colonels haven't lost at home all year. They've beaten an FBS school this year in Western Michigan. Life in the SLC, not easy week to week, even after a big win. You got to bring it the next week, don't you? That's right, but the McNeese Cowboys right now are rolling. Yeah. And whoever plays them better play well because they, they've got it going on. Well, Coach, tonight your team takes on New Mexico State. They're ACU's first FBS team since Hawaii all the way back in 1980. Now the Aggies are 0-7, but that comes from teams like Texas and, and UCLA. What have you told your team about maybe not quite paying attention to that win-loss column this week? Well, it doesn't take much to, to get past the fact that they hadn't won a game. Because the first thing you do as a coach, all right, you break things down by, by formation, by blitz, by play. You start looking at scheme. You start looking at personnel. And it doesn't take long to figure out, hey, they got some guys that can play now. Uh, and, the, and, they, they, and they know what they're doing. They're, they do a really good job. They're well coached. Fact is, they've played Texas, they've played UCLA, they've played uh, Minnesota. I mean, big time football teams. And there are a lot of people that would be 0 and 7 if they played some of the teams that uh, that New Mexico State has played. So, our guys are not concerned about the win loss deal. We're way more concerned about us. What we figured out this year is if we go play well and play clean, 
protect the ball, get a few takeaways, and make routine plays, then we'll have a chance. And uh, they will they will outmatch us in certain areas, as is, a lot of good teams do. There's a lot of average teams that at certain spots will outmatch you in certain areas. But there's also some situations where we should uh, where we should do well matchup wise. So the thing is, you want to minimize the the matchups where they have the upper hand, and you want to maximize your own. So uh, it'll be good. But if we if we go in there and play clean, which we've had a great week week of practice, we've had absolutely wonderful wonderful weather here in Abilene. So we've had no excuse but to practice well and practice hard. So uh, we should go down there and uh, and play well. This will be your fourth game this season against a member of NCAA Division I. However, two of those are either brand new to football, like Houston Baptist, or brand new to Division I, like Incarnate Word last week. So let me go back to Illinois State, a playoff team from the FCS last year. And you played them earlier this year. What did you take from that game in terms of preparing your team for this week, a team that you know either has had recent success on the D1 level or as an FBS team in the case of New Mexico State. Did you take anything from that Illinois State well, game as you get ready for this week? When we went to Illinois State, we knew we knew they were a good team. We didn't necessarily know how, how, how good they were. They were blown out the week before mm -hmm. against Eastern Illinois, who play, who's having a great season. Great year. Uh, we knew that we were going to have to play well, and at times we did. What we learned from that is you cannot relax because when you're playing against quality people, one play can literally make the difference mm -hmm. in a game. We give up a punt return on the last play of the first half yeah. that, that really, really hurt us. I don't know that that's what lost the game or won the game for them, but it didn't, sure didn't help at all uh, on our end. And we, do, we learned that you've got to play consistent in all three phases. You can never let up because people are going to have explosive guys that can make you pay, whether it's offensively or defensively or, or, or uh, return guys. Yeah. Well, you talk, you have to play good in games, but that starts in practice. And I got to talk with Justin Stewart just a little bit earlier this week, and he said one of the things that you needed as a team was to have the best week of practice that you've ever had all season in order to be able to go into this game this weekend to get a W in, in that win column. Have you been able to have the best week of practice so far this week? I don't know if it's the best. It's our guys. I know this. Our guys are focused. Our guys are excited. And you know, the bottom line is we're about to play game number nine. We're all kind of beat up mm. as coaches. You're kind of, who man, hey, you gotta, you gotta get yourself fired up when you go out to practice because it, it's a long season. We hadn't had a week off, and our guys are, our guys are fatigued. They're beaten up a little bit. So is it the sharpest? Is it the best? I don't know, but I know it's a quality week of practice. And what we have learned is when you do that, what you do is you set yourself up with a, with a resume. We talk about this all the time. With a quality week of practice, what you've done, you've put together a resume. This is what I've done throughout the week. Not one day, but a resume has to do with the vast time. So you put together a good resume so we can walk out there in Las Cruces on the 50-yard line before the game, put that res resume down on the 50-yard line and go, you know what? We're ready to play. We don't know what's going to happen, but the Wildcats are ready to play, and we feel like that uh, this week. Okay, so we know that the Wildcats can't go to the postseason this year. That's, that's part of the deal for the next few years as we transition to Division I. So I'm going to ask the question. This is one of those classic media guy questions that good. you love <laughs> so much. so good at that. I'm a media guy. So <laughs> is there a sense in which a win tonight against an FBS team could feel a little like a play. You won a lot of playoff games over the last few years. This almost feels like a ch almost like a playoff game to me. Broadcasting, it's FBS. It's on ESPN three. You've got a chance to shock. There have been fourteen FCS teams that have beaten FBS teams this year. Is that a media guy question? Or is there any, anything in there that, that, is that totally, resonates with you? It is totally a media question. Oh, but you know what? It's good. It's, it's oh, worth God. it's worth going after. Uh, it'll feel it'll feel great. Yeah. I mean, it, because. Uh, you know, it, we're, at, we're at a different point in our program that they are in mm -hmm. theirs. They're, regardless if they've won or lost, they're an established uh, FBS program. A lot of scholarships. With, yeah, yeah with, with, with academic support, advising, just the whole thing that goes with an FBS program. And we're a little bit outgunned. So it's always good, and it feels really good to beat a team where you feel like, you know what, we got to play really, really well, and you go on the road and you get that thing done. 
you know, the, the difference is when you win a playoff game like that, you're like, hey, you, there is immediate excitement on, hey, what's going on next mm. week? Where are we going? Are we going to be at home? Who is it? And uh, so it'll be different. But you know what? A win is a win, and this will be a great win uh, for ACU football well, if we get this thing done. Hopefully that happens, and we'll be there to chronicle all the action. Best of luck to your guys tonight. Well, we will have that broadcast for you on the ACU Sports Network coming up at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. Remember, the kickoff is in Mountain Time there in Las Cruces, New Mexico. But Lance Fleming and I will have the broadcast 7 p.m. kickoff, 6.30 pregame show Central Time there on the ACU Sports Network. For Kara Stutzman and for Coach Ken Collins, I'm Grant Boone. Thanks for watching the Ken Collins Show on KTexas and ACUOptimist.com. Enjoy the game tonight, and we'll see you next week right here.